is up, Zinger Nation. Welcome back to another episode of Ben Zinger Live. Happy Tuesday, everybody. What is up, Zinger Nation? Welcome to everyone joining us from the live trading show. As you guys can see, a little bit of a different background this weekend, a little bit of a different setup. I'm back home in St. Louis for Thanksgiving. I uh, hope everyone, you know, I hope everyone who's traveling home this week gets in safely, gets to spend some good time with their family. This week, this Tuesday, it is Tuesday, uh, which means we're going to continue our Kaiju educational series. Uh, last week, or actually a couple of weeks ago, now we touched on. Uh, uh, on brokerages. So if you'd like to check that out, figure out what the right brokerage is for you, uh, kind of compare the pros and cons of different brokerages, make sure to go to our YouTube channel and check that out again from a couple weeks ago. But without further ado, let's go ahead and bring on my man, Ryan Pinnell, the Kaiju CEO. Ryan, how are we doing today? Good. How are you doing, Aaron? Good. A couple weeks. I know. So last week, we, of course, uh, we were off for a week for the uh, Benzinga. We had our own conference in New York City. Uh, Ryan, I think you guys were doing some traveling as well. Uh, where are you going to be doing uh, Thanksgiving this year? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm based in Geneva, so we kind of, I hate to say it, skip Thanksgiving. It's just a, it's just a time for me to catch up on email. So. And yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm Canadian by birth anyway, so our Thanksgiving was like a month and a half ago, so... That's that's it. While you're all traveling and getting fat with turkey and hanging out with family, I'm just going to be doing derivatives math. So don't feel bad for me. It's fine. <laughs> I don't mind. Um, well, what I mean, so right now, uh, there's no so people in Geneva, I assume, like, don't really you're not going to be watching football celebrating, uh, uh, you know, the the Thanksgiving, really not even a holiday. Not even a holiday here. That that comes in like uh, two weeks when we celebrate Geneva's defense uh, of the walled city against some archduke and this woman who threw soup all over the invaders. So there's soup, there's a parade, there's a smashing of chocolate soup cauldrons. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a good holiday. It's called Escalade here. Got it. Well, that's good to know. You know, you learn something new, uh, learn something new every day. Yeah, exactly. I'm not sure how useful that is, but it's new. Got it. Um, all right. Well, Ryan, today we are going to be talking about, uh, you know, how to set up a trading platform. So we talked about a couple of weeks ago, how to pick which brokerage to go to. But now let's say you've, you, you've taken that step. You've picked your first one. Now we're going to talk about how to actually go ahead and set one up. Um, but, but, so if, if, you, if we have a broker, uh, why do we need to choose a platform? And what's the difference, I guess, between a, a, a trading brokerage and then the trading platform? So, I mean, at the most basic level, if you have a broker, you really just have a very rudimentary order entry system and you have like a portfolio view page, right? It's, it, the most basic are just going to look like your normal bank account, right? You go to some tab, you go to some screen, it'll list your holdings, uh, it'll track P&L, and there'll be a very rudimentary order entry system where you can manage your positions or add to them, et cetera, but, but no real tools, right? So more advanced uh, broker platforms, like let's say you have Thinkorswim, um, or you've opened an account with IB, a lot of these brokers will have attendant software. So IB has TWS, Trader Workstation, which has a mosaic, and user-friendly, more graphical interface, and then a classic system, which is a little more like uh, colored spreadsheets, really. And you can work like that. Or you can choose to add third-party uh, trading platform. Like for those of us on the institutional side, no broker account comes with software like ever so the whether you're using you know spider rock or wax or silex or bloomberg it just lays on top of your prime broker account and connects to all of your um, subsidiary brokerage accounts like you don't get that with with a regular institutional broker so you pick those packages based on what you're trying to accomplish. Are you just, and there's, you know, OMS, EMS, order management, execution management, 
or PMS, portfolio management. Like they're different tools. And you got something like Bloomberg that like smushes them all together. So you really want, you, you're thinking of adding a trading platform to give you access to information and tools might help you be a better trader. Ultimately, that's what you're looking for. And it boils down to personal preference and what you need to do the job. Right. We've talked about that before, just that every different trader and investor is going to have slightly different goals. If you're someone that wants to be out there day trading for eight hours a day and that's, you know, how you want to, you know, what, what you want to spend your time all day doing, or maybe, you know, you're busy doing other things and you want to make a couple trades a week. Obviously, in those two scenarios, like your trading is going to be a little bit different. Maybe what trading platform you want to go with uh, is going to be slightly different. Um so Ryan, let's. Um, it, it, what are the most important things to you to uh, to consider when choosing the right platform? Uh, are there different platforms for different kinds of traders? Sure, <clears throat> and I think I'm gonna I'm gonna sound like uh, you know I'm I'm just saying the same thing over and over again. But obviously, it depends on the type of trading you do and the asset class that you're working with and what you're trying to achieve. So you have like analytic platforms, like let's say LiveVault Pro, which is a SIBO product. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure anymore whether Live Vol, Vol Pro and LVX, which is the institutional product, are now combined. They might be, but that's you can't trade on that platform. But it's a ton of option specific analytic tools, earnings projections, scans, filters, obviously the montage. Um, so if you're an options trader, that may be an analytical component to your trading component. Something like Silex, for example, is just execution management. It, there's no capability for portfolio visualization with that, limited customization. But in terms of like order management, execution management, you're, you're primarily an executing trader. Silex is a great, great tool for that. Um, what comes with your what comes with the broker account sometimes is awesome. Like I, 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 somebody showed me or sent me a recent uh, clip of where Thinkorswim is at. It's actually pretty good. And um, TWS is totally functional for most types of trading. So yes, it boils down to what you want to do. We're going to, we're going to review one retail one today, which is TC2000. Um, and that can be used. I think Worden has a brokerage account available through Apex if you actually open with them, or you can use it just as an analytics platform and forget the trade part of it. So you can have more than one system. When I started, I had Trader Workstation for my execution management. And I would go back and forth between Classic and Mosaic. Um, Classic has really good risk uh, portfolio, holistic portfolio risk visualization tools. So I'd use that, had some rudimentary shock grids, which were better than nothing but all my analytics were done on TC2000. And then because I was heavy into options, I also had LVX running at the same time. So you see these setups where there's like eight screens or six screens or something. That's why, because you have these independent tools all over the place. And maybe that's for you. Got it. Um, and then right now, Ryan, uh, in terms of what, I guess, like, from a professional standpoint, how different are the professional trading platforms than what someone would use as like an individual? Like enormously different. Okay. So <laughs> I did, you know, just because people are always curious, I, uh, I screenshotted two of my three Bloomberg terminal screens. And we'll, we'll look at those today and I can sort of walk through why they're configured like that. And you know, like, you really don't, the, the average retail trader does not need that. Like, I need that because we run multiple funds. There are multiple portfolios in each fund. I can't bounce back and forth between like six different, you know, visualization tools. And so Bloomberg allows the consolidation in a single spot. It's helpful for me to review things like that. But um, otherwise, the professional tools quite often actually are missing really useful visualization components. I've never understood why they get rid of those. And they have sometimes weird forced metrics for portfolio management. Silex, for example, does not have the ability outside of a custom plugin that we paid to have developed. Um, you, you, it will not show anything but PL relative to the previous close which is like crazy. Like you're from inception PL. There's no way to get that 
in, in that system because it's really just execution management and mark to market day over day. And so for that, it's like, well, what do you care when you open this three weeks ago? Here's where it's marking today. Here's where it is today. It's like, okay, if you don't care what happened yesterday or the day before, that's fine. If you do, that's not a great tool for you. I really like Silex for execution, so fine. I used it extensively, but for portfolio visualization, no, nah, I never used it for that. So that's kind of the institutional tools are missing things that they probably should have and are hugely valuable to retail traders. And they contain things that I don't know who, they, who they're who they made for, but as an institutional trader, I didn't use them either. So it's a little odd. That's that's what I could say. Got it. And I know we're going to get to, uh, you know, those, those, uh, the screenshots and some of the pictures from the professional trading platforms in a second. Um, but going back to, I guess, like individual trading platforms, uh, what about pricing? What should someone expect in terms of how much they should be paying for a trading platform or what types of fees, uh, they can expect? Yeah. And it's, it's worth, um, if you can take a trial, if you can try it out for a month, it's worth trying it out before you commit to it to see if it makes any sort of difference to you. A cool looking trading platform is not going to make you a more profitable trader. I, I I totally thought that it would, you know, a million years ago when I started, I'm like, I want to use the same tools as the big boys. And it just, yeah, some of them, some of them help, but ultimately that's not the difference maker. In terms of costs, okay, so things like Thinkorswim or TWS are free, right? You, you open the brokerage account there, you get that for free. So that's great. Then your platform costs are going to be largely impacted by your market data feed fees. Because depending on what time of trading you do, if you do anything other than position trading, where you really can do like 15 minute delayed, um, you need real time. And that's just going to add cost to it. So at the low end of the scale, I don't know where TC2000 is right now, probably 70 to 100 bucks a month with all of their real-time options enabled. Maybe it's free if you open an account with Worden. No clue. You'd have to look into that. Um, and then, you know, Silex is going to start at $600 a month. I don't know what LVX and Live All Pro are now, but they used to be around five or $600 a month. And then, of course, you know, Bloomberg, you're two grand a month with a minimum two year contract. Uh, and then on top of that, you need market data connectivity. It doesn't just come with that. Usually the institution has its own existing contracts. We get real time data at the tick level from ICE. So, you know, we just use that contract in Bloomberg. Um, and then if you want anything extra, there are customization fees that some of the, some of these companies offer. Like Live Vault was actually pretty good about like when I was a small fund manager, they built some filters and scans for me that are now available to everybody who use that tool. You know, you make a business case, you're like, that's a really good idea. I think we'll put that in our development list. And like six weeks later, out it comes. So, you know, it runs the gamut. You know, you do not need to be spending $600 a month for software if you are not, you know, trading a at least a $250,000 account. Like it, that's really not going to help you. Hundred bucks a month is going to do everything that you. So anywhere between free and hundred bucks a month is awesome. Yeah, and I mean, like it, it doesn't sound like that much, um, but you know, maybe for some people are looking to, to to try to find like cheaper options and whatnot. Um, what about for someone like me, Ryan, who I might think like, okay, I'm a, I'm a pretty good trader. I can buy calls. I can buy puts. I can I can do all these different things. I can do it straight from my phone. Do I really need to go out of my way to like set up a trading platform or can I just trade off Robinhood or whatever it is off my phone? Well, it depends on how are you finding your candidates, right? Like what these trading platforms have as their sort of primary uh, value proposition is you know, deep scanning and filtering capabilities and analytical capabilities. Like if you're just reading financial news and, you know, your investment ideology is like, yeah, I'm going to put 200 bucks in this, or I feel like I'm going to, I'm going to short some Tesla today. Seems a little, seems a little rich for me. Okay, fine. And yeah, you don't need the analytical tools, but if you're somebody who's watching and you're saying, how do I find like the number one question, how do I find stocks to trade? What's a good stock to trade? Okay. So you can use some of these tools to see where volume weight is across stocks. Where's volume buzz? Some of the more advanced tools will show you, you know, pre-market and not pre-market, Please don't trade off pre-market signals. There aren't any, but you can see 
broker and flow. You can see early flows. You see broker reorganization, like inventory shifts, which is helpful. Like if you see a big block inventory shift, there's a reason that they move the inventory. So maybe it's got, you know, it's missed an earnings peak. It's setting up to have inventory to loan out for shorts. You, you know, can see where that is, like, where does that broker normally trade from an ax perspective, et cetera. And if you're a technical trader, chart analysis, indicators, all that stuff is important for you from an analytical perspective. So it really depends on how you trade. You, you know, I have no idea, Aaron, like Benzinga has some really good tools, you know, for aggregated news feeds. Awesome for that. Like we actually use Benzinga on the uh, professional side, uh, like side by side with Bloomberg. And I've said before, sometimes the news comes out on Bloomberg first and sometimes Benzinga beats them to it. So we run both. So you have that and then you have an analytical package if that's the type of trading that you do. Love to hear. I mean, I love to hear that you're, you guys are using uh, Benzinga in that sure. in that capacity and the fact that, you, you know, sometimes, like you said, it comes across even before Benzinga. So if you haven't tried Benzinga Pro, now's your chance. Pro.Benzinga.com. It's a free two-week trial. No no reason not to. Um, well, Ryan, let's, uh, you know, now we, we, we've learned a little bit more about trading platforms. Now we've got it selected. How do we, let's talk about how we get it set up to start trading. How should someone optimize their setup to gain an edge against all the other, you know, people trading out there against the algorithms trading? I mean, we need to do this properly, right? To give us a chance at success. Yeah, we do. And so we can start. So this is, if, if you guys aren't familiar with it, this is a really basic TC2000 layout. And because I don't use this anymore, I don't have any of the presets in here and scans that I and watch lists that I used to have, but it gives you an idea of roughly what it would look like. So normally on the left hand side, on the upper left, I would usually run scans for um, like time weighted volume at price, not not VWAP, but TWAP, um, which is an institutional mechanism for looking at like volume weighted trading versus time weighted trading, which I would not recommend. Um, and so like I would have indexes, global indexes in the upper left. So at a, at a glance, I could see like, you know, if we were early Eastern Standard Time and late European time, I could see where the European markets were closing relative to where um domestic markets were opening. I could see uh, where Asian markets closed. Uh, I had futures running. So when I first woke up in the morning, which is really early, I could see you know, what kind of an open we could expect. Um, I had like the two scans here. I have buy side and sell side um, markers that I would track to tell me what was moving institutionally on the buy side and the sell side. I'd always have a watch list. I would have my positions, obviously. Um, I would set alerts. You know, you should always use alerts. Always, always, always. And always get in the habit of you do not enter, manage, or exit a trade without making a note. Notes are really important. If you start to get really good at this, especially if you're a quantitative or systematic trader, and you do really well, I guarantee at some point the SEC is showing up at your door and they're going to ask you how you determine that this was a buy or this was a short on this day. And the notes are what you need. You know, So in that note, it's, I reviewed this, I found this, I found this volume signature, it correlated to this, these indicators lined up. I looked back at, you know, if you do fundamental analysis, I look back on that. And here's how I sized my trade. Here's where I managed it. Here's where I exited. That is the difference between, you know, getting in trouble and you will get in trouble if you're like, oh, I don't know, I had the MACD crossover and that's why I traded it. Like, you know, you get that wrong and you happen to be one of the only people that enter right before information hits and your sister's cousin somehow has a relationship with that company. Like be safe, take notes. It also helps you to learn later. If you see recurrent patterns or you get burned a couple of times, you can pull notes up by tags. So keep notes. And then obviously you have an order entry system. You have your on deck and like this is this is waiting. You know, if you have GTC orders, which are going to be all your stops or any buy stop limit orders that haven't kicked yet. 
that you're comfortable with leaving on past the day, you can have that in there. Then you get over to the charting window. So this is sort of a rudimentary window that I used to use. Um, it's missing maybe two proprietary indicators, but they're irrelevant really. So I've got black and white candlesticks on a white background for like the millionth time for the cheap seats. Please don't use colored candlesticks on a black background unless you like losing money. If you want to build proper pattern recognition skills, you've been doing it your whole life reading black characters on white pages. And so you have this built in enormous advantage recognizing black and white patterns on a white background, which is why you look at it like this. And then price is useless without volume. Warden or TC2000 has time segmented volume, which is like maybe the most underrated and useful indicator you could ever become comfortable with. So that's next. You run a 20, 25, 18, 14, whatever your periodization preference is, uh, front weighted moving average. Under that, you, you want a strength of trend indicator. So that's RSI. And I use an RS, instead of RSI uh, and then a moving average, I use another RSI as my moving average. So I use RSI 14 or 15 over RSI 75. So that shows you the strength of the short-term trend over the strength of the long-term trend, which is useful. And then you have a stochastics um, percent D and K. Uh, and when we get to the show on indicators, I'll share all the actual individual settings for these things if you want to play around and see what works for you. The most important thing is the time frame and the aspect ratio of that chart. So if you took that chart and you squished it by half vertically or horizontally, that pattern is going to look completely different. And so what you need to do is make sure that you are always looking at every chart exactly the same way. Now you pick your time frame. For me, it's eight months, you know, across the X axis and the window for the chart alone. So just the candlestick chart up there is always, always the golden rectangle. If you don't know what that is, you can Google it. It's a rectangle based on the golden ratio. There are free calculators online. And whichever is your limiting factor, horizontal or vertical, literally hold a tape measure up to the screen, go to a golden rectangle calculator, punch in the axis you have no control over, and then get the answer to the axis you do have control over. And every chart you ever look at will look exactly the same in terms of pattern. So you want to make sure that you've done that. Because otherwise, if it's too vertically compressed, Steep looks steeper than it actually is. If it's too flat, it looks calmer than it and safer than it actually is. So you do not want to mess around with that. So that's those are the sort of basic principles to setting up a trading platform from the beginning. If you set it up that way, you can tab through like a million stocks on your watch list. You can immediately see whatever crossovers are meaningful to you. Whatever patterns that you have identified as being meaningful to you will be immediately apparent. Last thing, log scaling. Do not tur turn on arithmetic scale scaling. It'll flatten out to a tiny little line. All charts always log scaled. Black and white candles on a white background. That's it for this one. So there's so there's a there's a common retail trading platform setup. Okay, so this is the analytical preview of my. Bloomberg terminal. Um, I have uh -oh, now, we're, now we're getting into the, the inside baseball, the secret. A lot of people watching probably right. have never, a lot of people watching have probably never even seen what this looks like on the back end, Ryan. So thank you for. Uh, right. Okay. So um, I did this, I think, yesterday morning, my time. So my domestic market level two obviously wasn't running. Uh, and I picked uh, uh, an LSE stock that was uh, that was trading, uh, which was Shell, just so I could get some live data in here to show you guys. But if you see the market data not subscribed there, where I would normally be looking at depth of book, it's because I only use that for uh, domestic securities, not international. So this is an analytics pane, and I, I use three different screens, and they're all 6K. 
but I don't use three different 6K monitors, right? I just, I tab between these screens doing three different things. So this is like, I'm interested in analysis of a specific underlying or ETP. Um, and so you can notice that even on a Bloomberg terminal, I still have black and white candlesticks on a white background. That rectangle at the top is the golden rectangle. I'm still looking at um, my volume indicator. And then, you know, Bloomberg has some obviously different ones that are institutional in nature. And, you know, we might have written a couple of those. So I use some of those. They're not meaningful any more meaningful than the other indicators I showed. Please don't look at this and think that these are like better crossovers or there's some sort of magic red light, green light. Those don't exist anywhere, no matter what terminal you use. These four indicators or five are more meaningful for me in the type of analysis I'm doing. I do not trade off of indicators. So there's no combination that's like, oh yeah, look at that setup and these three crossovers, I'm in. Doesn't work that way. Please don't do that. Um, on the left-hand side, the one that you could definitely work without is that second pane, which is normally depth of book. You guys probably call that L2 or level two. That is not useful for your trading anymore. It used to be like 20 years ago, depth of book was an additional data feed you had to pay for. It was super useful, um, but now it is no longer useful for you. It's useful for us because we're an AI trading shop. And what you're normally seeing now in depth of book is um, machine preloads and reversals of flow. So it's it, it's not going to tell you anymore. Oh, you know, just just three, you know, three levels up from from the offer here. Look at that stack of sell orders. No, no, it's not a person that's not there. You cannot infer anything from that. Please ignore it. You have analytical tools, including um, on the left-hand side, order flow, and where appropriate, if this was domestic data and it was running live, you could see the ax there, um, which is the exchange where most of the trades for this particular security will print, but you have to pay for that. And then you have some comps on the lower left. If we go to the right-hand side, most of this is analysts and various analytics. So you have access to analyst reports, you have a graphical earns, uh, hits and misses, you have a news feed, consolidated news feed here. And to be clear, yes, I do run Benzinga simultaneously on my iPad when I'm running this on the Bloomberg. Um, and then on the upper left, the blue and red, those are a collection of meaningful comps um, that this is being judged against. So this gives you kind of a holistic view of where this underlying sits relative to its own history, to its own performance, to broad sector and industry performance, and the most meaningful tear sheet statistics, et cetera. There's some tabs on here that I would scroll through if I want to see like where the guidance came in last time. I really don't do that since I'm we don't use that for our trading. So this is this is an institutional analytical view for an underlying. And then the other one I can show you guys is the global view. So if I'm not, if my desk guys don't call me and say, hey, you know, can you look at Melly and just tell us what you see in terms of ABCD? We do run a Volar portfolio and that's handled by... Um, Matt Shu or Mark Shu and Matt Velotica. And those guys sometimes will ask for my perspective on something. I use the analytics screen. But normally, heads up view is this thing right here. Like I'm writing emails, um, I'm using Slack, I'm writing reports, I'm talking to our team, managing any one of the five companies that I run. This is what's up. This is global market condition. This is the this is the trading of each one of the um, major index ETFs. I use that rather than the index itself because the ETF is busier behavior that's more meaningful. I have top, up and down movers globally. The map that Bloomberg has is pretty cool. You can choose hotspots, climate issues, war zones, whatever it is. If you want like a comparative analysis of global trends. 
and and this is two different news aggregation views. So this would be, and then of course, obviously like Bloomberg TV is going in the upper left up there, which I have on silent because I mostly don't. Which isn't as good as Benzinga. TV. I know, I know. It doesn't have, it doesn't have personalities like you on there, no, right? Okay. So, you know, I will have that on, on silent. So if there's something breaking, I can just hit the mute button and I will immediately get access to that information. But honestly, 10% of my day, I'm paying attention to this collection of screens, right? I'm mostly doing other work. And this is like, so when something pops up, when someone says, oh my God, you know, the reaction to, to Powell's comments are nuts. I can like, I can turn my head to this and I see the whole picture all at once, you know, from news on to analytics. So it's useful from that perspective. You don't need this. A lot of these uh, retail packages, you can configure like this. TC2000 has like a 16 up display. You would never watch underlines like that. It's not meaningful at this size. I would only ever watch global indices or derivatives based on the indices like this. It's meaningful from that perspective, but not from a, yeah, these are like, you know, 16 stocks that I'm trading right now in my portfolio. Like, what can you tell from a you know, from a, a an underwater line plot, like nothing. It does nothing for me. If I really care, I go to the other view and I tab through the portfolio holdings and they will load in that chart window and I get meaningful data. So this is how these packages tend to look when they're fleshed out institutionally. The third screen is all of the risk and portfolio management, which I didn't screenshot for obvious perp for obvious reasons. The most important being that the uh, chief compliance officer watches these podcasts and shows that I do and would freaking murder me. if That's I no fun, that. Ryan. Come on, uh, man. Rules rules were meant to be broken. No one yeah, meant to be broken. yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, 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 not those rule. rules. Not, not, not Eileen's rules. They, they end in death. So just, you know, I just do the safe thing. You know, none of this is from our portfolio. It's just, you know, dummy data that I found and I popped up. Well, I look at all this stuff anyway, but. So that's my that's my take on uh, setting up trading platforms. There you go. Well, uh, I, I mean, what, what, let's I guess now we've set it up. Let's let's get into what it looks like to actually trade. How do you identify uh, good opportunities? How how do you actually go about executing uh, that trade? I mean, this isn't going to be overly helpful because it comes back to the it depends on how you trade. So, you, you know, you want to ask yourself first, like, hopefully you're not an intraday trader if you're watching this. Like, it's, it's just not a profitable way to trade. Hopefully, the and, most and when you active, say that, you mean like trading in and out in the same day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Not, not that you don't rebalance intraday. Absolutely manage as soon as it makes sense to do so. Don't waste time. But like scalping for pennies or, no, I was in at 765. Now I'm out at 785. Don't do that. Like, none of us do that. Just so over time, that's that not going to work, you're saying? The HFTs don't do that. And, you know, when they do, it's order flow overrun that basically depresses the stock so it can close it out after it does that. And if you don't have $10 million, you can fire off in 60 seconds. You can't do the same thing. So don't do that. So presuming you're like a Momo or swing trader at your most active what are you looking for? You're looking for ideally pre-breakout or pre-breakdown stocks. So you're going to use for TC2000, there's like a, a forum that lists all of the PCF formulas for every single modern candlestick pre-breakout or breakdown pattern. You can like cut and paste them, make your own little indicators, little arrows will pop up, they'll show up on scans. And so you need to build scans that make the make quick work of what you're looking for. I mean, if you're just lead on momentum, like vol buzz is one that comes with like every package you could totally use. That's what's moving right now in this instant. Okay, cool. So you run that scan, you pull it up in your charting software, you look through it, does it have sufficient liquidity? Is it the right price point for you? You could tailor that in the scan to just feed you what you want. Then you're going to use an order management system, set up your bracketed buy stop limit order or buy sell stop or sell stop limit order above or below so that you force price to move in the direction you think it's going to move in. 
Don't fire at market. Don't use a limit order like naked by itself. We don't do that. You shouldn't either. And then as it starts to move, you're going to execute and then you're going to need tracking tools, right? You get, you need to be able to see how the portfolio is doing. If you can have access to holistic portfolio management, which identifies like you're waiting within the portfolio, that's usually meaningful because you might not be paying attention to that. Maybe you are just like in all day long and you do not see that you just way overloaded in tech. And then the next day there's some, some news release of a new executive order and a new era of tech regulation and the queues tank and they take your whole portfolio with you. So, you know, having some holistic portfolio management, seeing how you are correlated against the beta queues, you know, IWM if you're a small cap person, IVV if you don't like SPY, whatever it is, you can pick that from a drop down and you'll see your skew and your parabolic profile. You can see where you line up and how far you should track based on movement of your beta. So like that's important to set up in future, uh, in future episodes, we'll get into like actual placing orders, order management, and we'll get into the, the periodization and settings for some indicators, but that's my really overly caffeinated fast version of how to set up what to consider setting up a trading platform. And I think that is helpful. I mean, I'm seeing people in the in the chat saying that, uh, you know, a lot of good info here. HTX Tex is saying that uh, super helpful info. So, uh, you know, even if you feel like you're getting in the weeds a little bit, Ryan, I think today, you know, a lot of people are taking away a lot of, uh, uh, you know, really helpful information and, and, and usable information that could help uh, take our trading to the next level. Let's zoom out a little bit. Um, and think big picture. How do you best view your, uh, or how to best view your portfolio uh, or best practices of when to do that? You know, should you be, I guess, like monitoring your portfolio success every single day? You mentioned maybe rebalancing intraday, but uh, like, how, how do we, how do we zoom out and gauge how our portfolio is doing? So for the, for the, for the 12th time today, it depends on your trading style, right? So if, if you're momentum trading and you are like, let's say shortest term is like close to close, uh, something like that. Uh, one day, one trading day turnaround, something in that vein. You know, you're, you're looking at it intraday. You for sure, you're not trading in and out intraday, but you're monitoring it. If you don't have time to monitor it, then I would make like extensive use of alerts, right? Because you can just tap out. You're like, okay, I don't really, I don't need the stress of watching this thing like dip down to my stop loss. No, it's not going to touch it. Dip down again. No, it's not going to touch it. Dip down again. And I'm sitting there and my life is literally ticking away while I'm watching this. We've all done it. So I can just say like, depending on the price of the stock, when you're a nickel, when you're 25 cents, when you're two bucks from my stop loss, send me an alert, you know, text an SMS or whatever it supports an email. And then I can go get on with my day. I don't really need to be there. It can run in the background. I can pull it up if I need it. That's like the most active, certainly in fast moving markets. When the pandemic really hit and we had those first couple of days where there were, you know, the circuit breakers were tripped and trading halted. Yeah. I like didn't step away from the terminal. Neither would anybody else. You are there micromanaging in that environment. But otherwise, if you're a position trader, Sundays, like you don't have to look at this all week. Like you've already set a profit taker and you've already set a stop loss. And it's either going to hit one or the other, or it's not there yet. And once a week, I mean, you're talking a time frame that's six, three to six months out. So once a week, you can, you can tab through or space bar through all of your holdings. Like, ah, it's close. I don't like that. Maybe it's close to your profit taker, but you see a breakdown pattern. And you're like, okay, so you move up that stop loss to like just under the previous close and you forget about it. So if it does break down, you'll come out, right? Because as soon as the stop loss triggers, it's a market order. So you're just done. You don't even have to worry about it. You get a notification that you're closed out and that's your profit. You know, IB systems like that, you can use elastic and dynamic profit stops that will trail by either a percentage or a or a or a dollar value so that you can again not pay attention. It keeps moving up and it's offset by 10 cents, it's offset by 20 cents, and but it doesn't move back. 
So price retraces, it hits the stop, you're out again. So like I, I don't, well, okay. So institutional traders who manage portfolios are just staring at the portfolio all day long, for sure. And there's coverage, like there's multiples. And then when one goes to the bathroom or has lunch or whatever, there's multiple eyes on it. You don't need to do that if you don't have like 600 positions going on or you're not a momentum trader. Um, several times a day, check in here and there. And always, 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 if you do a lot of uh, pattern-based trading, you have to recalibrate your visual screen. I probably should have mentioned that before. Because if you're sitting there looking at like a thousand candlestick charts, you will just glass over. You will stop seeing patterns. Like you could go buy your ideal setup and you won't register it. So you can't do that. A lot of guys who are chartists will do uh, like 25 minutes on, five minutes off. I, when I was a lot younger, I did 50 minutes on, 10 minutes off was my program. And you need to recalibrate your visual screen. Some guys actually painted an 18% medium gray wall in their office. And they would look physically at the wall for like 10 minutes while thinking about whatever the hell they were thinking about, what they needed to do after close. And that would reset their visual screen. Me, I lived in the Caribbean at the time. I turn around, I look at the ocean which was a much better view in my opinion, but I wasn't looking at candlesticks. So when I come back around and I start cycling through, I'm fresh enough to see those patterns again. So that's sort of you know how to manage those trades using those platforms. I'm with you, man. I'd rather be looking at the ocean than a gray wall, but, uh, you know, Hey, to each their own, whatever helps your trading. I'm sure a lot of those, uh, traders would have looked at whatever, if it would have helped their trading, let alone a, a gray wall. Um, Ryan, uh, what about things to avoid common pitfalls besides looking at gray walls and, uh, red flags that you can, you can think of red flags is that, you know, your entire profitability is somehow buried in the, these trading platforms. Like that's the biggest red flag. And I know it's hard when you start to shake that feeling. I mean, I, I start our chief technology officer, David Schooley and I, he was a prop trader when I was a professional trader. And I mean, I don't know how many platforms we evaluated, but Half of them don't exist anymore, but we were convinced that there were visualization tools, scanning tools, indicators that we could use that were everything. You know, so I set up this view. I have these scans. I have these tools. I use these indicators. You know, a it's not going to be red light, green light, but it's three of five. It's four of five. I'm in. I'm out. I wash, rinse, repeat, and I'm going to be a profitable trader. And it just doesn't work that way. They're all assistive. And they're only assistive so far as you find them meaningful. I mean, I've probably written, I don't know, 20 indicators myself. David's probably written an equal amount. I mean, give him like crazy names like confidence or panic button or I forget what the hell we named some of them. And they were, you know, very sophisticated, you know, strength of trend or volume pressure indicators. But if you use, and we'll talk about this in the indicators episode, if you use too many of these things, you will always, always find something that contradicts what you see. Like you line up 20 indicators and they're all super valuable to you. And six of them will say go, six of them will say you're crazy. And six of them will say like nothing, you know, whatsoever. And two are inconclusive. So, or lean mildly one way or another. And so more isn't better. They match the type of trading you do. You're a fundamental trader that position trades. You care way, way more about like money stream, institutional ebb and flow of capital than you do some stochastics indicator. You know, that's a Momo indicator. Like that is a trend indicator or TSV. Well, TSV is useful to everybody, but I'd care less about RSI if I was a uh, a long-term position trader. It's irrelevant. I don't care about the strength of the current price trend. I care about how much money institutions are piling into this thing because it's going to drive the price ultimately. It's, you know, institutional bias. So I'd have those tools, you know, flow of funds indicators, that kind of thing. So you set it up to give yourself the best possible chance of success. But honestly, this will come off wrong, <laughs> but the best tool that you have is you and your confidence in your trading style. Like if you have done the work to determine that you have edge, 
you know, consistently, you know, using the law of large numbers, X happens to you more than Y and X is profitable, then, you know, find the tools that help you make that process quicker and less painful and trust the process and be open to reevaluation. If it breaks, look at other things play around in the downtimes during the market. Like when this show is on, like nobody's doing anything at 11 o'clock in the morning, right? I mean, you're really just, you know, desperately hoping that mid-morning coffee kicks in and wondering where you're going to have lunch. 100%. Um, well, Ryan, I appreciate you, you know, going over some red flags. Personally, I mean, I my, my, I agree, you know, your best tool is you're going to be yourself and 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 being able to adapt and, and learn new strategies and new things. Confidence in my trading is certainly something I'm not lacking, if anything, too much. And I might need to be like, hey, maybe you're not as as sharp as you think you are sometimes. And maybe you shouldn't throw that much money on this trade that you're not, you know, haven't done all the due diligence on. But it doesn't mean I'm not confident in it. Um, well, Ryan, um, what uh, we talked about this earlier, kind of how different a, a professional trading platform from a one that an individual might be using what one do you currently use uh for your professional needs at kaiju and which one did you use when you first started trading and kind of what are the differences in how they operate um well i mean i use bloomberg now sorry uh and, hey, and do and, not apologize we you and know. we and you know for institutional reasons you know it's 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 not necessary but it's necessary for what we do fine and then, you know, we're looking at news on Benzinga. Additionally, the traders use P7 tools. They use Spider Rock. I don't know if we're still using Silex. Um, there's traders will come with a toolkit that they want to use. And you generally don't shove them into a box and say, you use these tools. Every trader, institutional trader can use Bloomberg and most do. But especially for the, you know, the, our Volarb guys, option specific, it's really not the best tool. So we make sure that they have the best tool, whether that's Spider Rock or whether that's Wex is another institutional grade options trading platform. Um, those have, you know, Vol surface calibration tools that these guys use. You would never use them. You don't care about them as a retail options trader. Live All Pro awesome little complimentary piece of software. When I started, I mean, when I really started, started, and there was no, there was limited internet. The modem made like a squeaky dial-up noise. That's how, that's how old I am. When I started there, it was like, there just wasn't anything available. It was what came with your bank's brokerage account, which as I said, was basically nothing. Rudimentary order entry. And then, you know, I moved to retail brokerage account tools, something like doesn't exist anymore, but something like Thinkorswim was fine with me. And then when I moved into like small fund management, that was uh, interactive brokers and TWS, I spent many, many years bouncing back and forth between TWS and Mosaic. Um, and then added Silex on top of that, Live All Pro, um, and then Bloomberg. So it, it, you know, it, it runs the game. over time. And I, I should say I use TC, TC 2000 actually as a professional, I used that for a really long time as a, as an analytics platform because Bloomberg actually hadn't caught up to it in terms of its analytic capabilities. And some of its visualization tools were just way better. So I actually had them both, you know, and I've, I've done everything. I had eight screens once six i had curve monitors i had an up and down pair of 4k monitors and then four curved you know 2k monitors and now i'm just down to like one apple xdr pro display because i just and a, and a laptop like i wonder I'm too if that's old, a, too I, old I, to keep looking at like eight monitors yeah right? i wonder if that's a common theme among like tra traders and professional traders that as you know, you progress into your trading journey, you get more and more advanced, have all these different screens and stuff. And then as you continue, you kind of start unwinding some of them. And you're like, maybe I don't need all of that, but at least I've got what I need. You know, you kind of yeah, find what works true. for you, what yeah. needs. Most traders I knew use two screens, just two. Yeah. And two, I mean, I, I see the time. Yeah. I see guys with setup sometimes where they'll have eight different monitors and all these different screens. I have to say from what I've seen, I do not think there is a correlation between the amount of screens you have and what your returns will be as a trader. I haven't 
done any you know research studies or anything like that on it. But 100%. from what I've seen anecdotally, I can tell you that there's no correlation. In fact, there could even be an inverse correlation. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, Ryan, we, we've 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 covered a lot of info today. A lot of people in the chat, uh, you know, saying that this uh, info has been very helpful. Let's kind of let's go ahead and recap. Let's go ahead and pull up our kaiju kicker. Uh, let's go over some of the trading tips we talked about today. Uh, Ryan, I'll let you take it away. All right. So top takeaways again. Like pick a platform that contains the tools you need to best support your trading styles. Don't pick something because it looks cool or it has like the possibility to configure all these panels. If it creates noise for you and you never use them, then it's not worth paying for. It's not worth using. Okay, please, please. It doesn't look as cool. I totally admit, but consider a black and white chart view to maximize your pattern recognition success. Um, there are a lot of institutional studies that have been done that indicate that traders that use red and green candlesticks on a black background are 30% less profitable by and large than traders that use black and white candlesticks on a white background. And that is just because your whole life you've been conditioned to see green as go and red as stop. Even if you love shorting and you're trying to tell yourself red is awesome and green is I should pause you actually have to undo your brain's pattern recognition to get that to work out. Whereas black and white doesn't mean anything to you. So it's just setups. You don't immediately interpret black as bad and white as good, which lets you more efficiently see patterns very quickly that you can then confirm with supplementary data. So please give that a, a consider that. Um, if you're going to add add-ons that increase costs, ask if you really need them to be successful. So you know, for example, and this is, uh, you, you guys, I think all know, I don't get paid by Benzinga to be here. So, you know, adding something like a news aggregator like Benzinga is probably reasonable because other than Bloomberg, I don't know a lot of charting or analytical packages that come with as robust a news aggregator. So if you really want that, I think it also has a, a, a pretty active chat component to it. So if you want to continue this dialogue, you guys are all talking, then it's useful to build community. Trading retail by yourself in the beginning is lonely as hell. And it's only natural that you want to, you know, bash some ideas around with other traders. But charting and analytical packages are designed to look super cool and draw you in to pay a hundred or a couple hundred bucks a month. And you need to ask whether or not it's doing anything for you. And then, you know, finally, you can consider more than one solution to get exactly what you need. So, you know, even as an institutional trader, or I should say, okay, institutional trader, I use Bloomberg, but as a small fund manager, right, with like, you know, 5 million under management, I, I couldn't afford a Bloomberg terminal. I couldn't afford, you know, $50,000 every two years. It was like insane. Um, plus I, like, I didn't need it to visualize what I needed to visualize in something like interactive brokers. So I use trader workstation with my interactive brokers account. It has terrible charting and, and analytical tools, um, outside of holistic portfolio risk management. So I use TC 2000 as an, as a scanning filtering, um, and analytics platform. Uh, Benzinga didn't exist back then. There was another news aggregator. I can't remember. It might have been like money.net or something. So I had that because I didn't have Bloomberg newsfeed. Um, and then I used LiveVol Pro and eventually LiveVol X, LVX, as my options package. So as I'm like, there's four packages that went into that to kind of get what I needed. So, so don't feel bad if that's what you need. If that's what you need to run a successful business, hey, Go get it. Good for you. If you need to run one giant screen, two small screens, a bunch of little screens, it's irrelevant as long as it's the best, most optimal workflow for you. So just keep those things in mind. And, you know, obviously we'll cover some more detail in how to use these tools going forward. Yeah. I mean, again, Ryan, this is, I, I thought just a lot of super helpful info. And I mean, guys out there that are watching this live, uh, you can always go back and, and, you know, once this is uploaded on YouTube and, and rewatch parts of it again, we'll, we'll chapter it out. So we have the different, uh, topics and, and Ryan can't thank you enough. 
Uh, th this is part three of eight of our educational series. We, of course, added, we, we had the additional one with the Biden AI because we got to be flexible and anytime there's huge AI news like that, we got to slip it in. Uh, but next week, part four next week, same time, 11 a.m. Eastern, uh, right here on Ben Singa's YouTube. We'll be talking about indicators. So now that you've got your trading platforms and brokerages set up, we're going to be talking about how to use indicators uh, to help you find trades, to help you uh, execute trades and everything else. I mean, I'm excited about the indicators because I only use a couple right now, Ryan. And I have a Everybody feeling. loves the indicators, you know? And the question everyone always asks is like, what settings should I use? What, what indicators, yeah. what settings? Okay, fine. I will give you like swing, position, Momo settings, the indicators that you would use for each one, what you might consider. I mean, like set them up, throw them up there. If you don't like them, get rid of them. It doesn't matter. There's not a right or wrong to this. Um, and and we'll just make sure that you have the appropriate settings so that your uh, poorly poorly configured indicators are, are useless and, and well-configured indicators are useful. So we just want to make sure that you're in the latter category and not the former. Yep. And uh, again, like just right now, I'm only using a couple. I have a feeling we're going to learn a lot more about different indicators next week, how to use them. Uh, so Ryan, thanks again for hopping on this week. Of course, Ryan Pinnell, the CEO of Kaiju. If you guys want to learn more from Kaiju, we've got links in the description as well. You can check out the DIP ETF, DIP. Ryan, we'll, uh, we'll see you next week. Always a pleasure. Happy and safe Thanksgiving to uh, all you folks in the U.S. celebrating. And Boom. we will see you next week. Beautiful. Let's do it. All right, guys. Again, this has been episode three of the Kaiju Educational Series talking about how to set up trading platforms. All righty, guys. Again, that was Ryan Pinnell from Kaiju. Links are in the description if you'd like to learn more from Kaiju. Just a, a very... Uh, a very interesting company and what they're doing with their dip ETF and whatnot. So I implore you guys to go check out uh, more of that. Hold on one second. I'm getting used to my, my at home setup here. All right. Something real quick. We're going to do something a little different. So in about 30 minutes, I'm going to be talking to the CEO of Moneyline. We've talked uh, to D a few times now. Uh, on the show, Moneyline reported earnings last week, I believe, and we're going to uh, uh, be talking to D in 30 minutes. Before then, I've got an interview that we actually recorded in the office last week. This one is going to be a little bit different um, than what we would typically do on the show. So uh, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to be talking uh, to Ryan O'Hanessy, who is from um, TrueLeave, actually working in the cannabis industry. We connected uh, at our uh, Benzinga event down in Chicago a few months ago. Uh, and on top of being in the cannabis industry, Ryan is also an EDM DJ and talks a lot about mental health. And so, you know, him and Raznik connected and we're having some great conversations. So thought it'd be good to bring him on the show. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and play this video from last week. Again, uh, I'll be hanging out here still in the chat. If you guys want to <coughs> ask or talk about anything in the chat, I'll be right here. And then I'll be back live again in 30 minutes for the interview with Moneyline. I mean, a little bit of a special interview today. Typically, you know, we'll have uh, different publicly traded companies on, investors. But today, I'm going to do something a little bit closer to the heart. I'm going to be bringing on my man, Ryan, uh, from Medtronica. We're going to talk on some different topics like mental health, cannabis, music, uh, all topics that I like. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and bring Ryan on the show. All right, Ryan, how are you doing today? Hey, what's up, Aaron? I'm doing good. How are you? I am good. So let's start. Uh, why don't you just give our audience a, a, a brief introduction? Like, what do you do for work? And how did you kind of like find yourself into these passions and hobbies that you have today? Yeah, for sure. So I work for TrueLeave. Um, I run their national paid media. So I'm a senior paid media manager over there. So running all digital out of home or Twitter ads. Uh, things in relation to paid media. So that's my association to to cannabis. And um, I've, I've been using cannabis like many uh, as a part of my mental health routine for quite some time from like low dose and CBDs and low dose THCs, uh, sublinguals and things like that. And um, I, I've always been a, a huge lover of music, like many people uh, who, who use cannabis or who don't. But Electronic music specifically has been has been a big passion of mine since I was uh, I 
think like 13 or 14. Um, I got introduced to it when I was traveling abroad. Uh, I competed in swimming and I was in Italy and we got stopped by the cops for jumping over a, a turnstile and like the trains, like you jump the subways in New York yeah. and we jumped them in Italy, just like a bunch of dumb kids doing dumb things. And one of the older guys on my team, uh, when the cops like pulled us over to the side, they were like, who are you? Like, we need ID. And he was like, oh, I don't have ID on me. And he gave him this name. He gave him a fake name. And the name was John Digweed. And I looked at him and I was like, who is John Digweed? Um, I had no idea at the time. And he's like, go look him up. And he, turns out he's like one of the most famous underground electronic music uh, artists. And that was kind of my introduction to, to electronic music as like a kid. And it's always been for me, um, like a really safe space to go to, to like process uh, just like the way I'm feeling or like to make me feel happy or if I'm like feeling emotional music and specifically electronic music has always been um, a really big part of my life in that regard. And uh, <clears throat> about a year ago, I uh, went through a really tough time. I went through a tough breakup and uh, electronic music was something that was really helping me get through and process that. And it kind of formed into this idea where I was like, I'm going to interview artists and I'm going to build a community based out of this uh, on social media. And it's turned into something really, really cool. And I'm really happy about it. Yeah, that's odd. I mean, it's everyone has like a different stories of how they get into certain types of music. But for you to have such an interesting uh, way that you kind of del delved into the world of electronic music, that's... Uh, that's fast. I love that story. Uh, I'm gonna have to go look him up and see see some of that because I was I'm not familiar. Um, but yeah, we're we're based Benzinga's based here in Detroit, which is actually kind of like the birthplace of techno in the United yes. States. So I've kind of uh, since moving up here a couple years ago. That's kind of been my foray into that world, and um, it's 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 been very very enjoyable because as I'm sure you know, there's just so many. It, it's like it's like a one big umbrella and then once you're in it there's just so many different things so many different types and you meet all these different types of people so it's been, it's been really awesome that's amazing yeah detroit it's still one place i haven't been to visit yet and it's on my places to go and make a pilgrimage there because it is the birthplace of techno and has so much so much to offer i want to go to movement next year so i'm looking forward to that yeah i was at yeah i was gonna say i was at movement last year that's something you should definitely uh consider because it's very uh like unique to this city. And I think it's different than a lot of other festivals that I've been to. So, um, well, Ryan, so I, I guess, um, you know, talking about cannabis and, and mental health, what, you know, I guess outside of cannabis, like what kind of things do you do to help with mental health and what, the, what do you think cannabis helps with specifically? Oh, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so I'll answer, I'll answer like, what other things do I do outside to help with mental health. And then I, I use cannabis as a part of that routine. So we'll tie it in. Um, I do a bunch of different things. Uh, I think like there's like three or four main components that just help people overall. Um, I'm somebody who like, we all have different genes, different gene makeups, and I've delved into the science of like, how does my brain work? And I've had tests done that you could buy these tests on Amazon. Anyone could buy them. And they, like test if you have it's called the MTHFR, I believe so. And if not, I'll I'll get it correct and I'll drop it in in the chat. But it basically tests if you uh, have these two genes that are going to impact you either positively or negatively negatively in producing um, either dopamine or serotonin and helping with that process. And I was like, well, let me look into this and see if this is something I have because I just I felt like something was off, and it comes back that I do have those genes. So I struggle, my brain struggles to just produce enough as it is. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm, I, I want to try and do some things holistically to just help improve overall mental health. So like one, getting enough sleep, uh, that's probably the biggest thing, getting enough sleep, um, two, making sure that I'm eating super clean and I'm eating enough. I find that if I don't eat enough, like we all get hangry, but that's like a real thing uh, for me. So making sure I'm eating enough exercise is probably the biggest part. Do you still swim? I still swim. Um, 
I had like a love hate relationship after college with swimming where I was like, cause I, I swam in college and you know, yeah, I think a lot of college athletes get like that where they just get burnt out of whatever sport. Yeah. My, my cousin played D one tennis and he like legitimately, I think he's 27 now, 28. And he legitimately has not picked up a racket since college. He said for sure. And there's like, I think when anything becomes like part of a business or like your passion has like a business aspect to it with like college sports, it is in a sense, uh, you're a part of the business as far as college sports go, you're, you can lose like touch of that love you've had. Right. Um, and that was definitely a part of it for me. So, uh, I definitely went through that phase, but swimming is still like, I, I need to be connected to water. So whether it's swimming or I get to surf and I do that, but getting in touch with water is really important for me. Um, and then lifting, I found that like lifting really heavy, really helps improve, uh, my, my overall mental health. And then I'm super fortunate. My brother, uh, who I live with, he just bought an ice bath, like one of those freezers, like oh, legitimate yeah. freezers that you convert. And that I've been testing out the past week. And that has been like cold water therapy has been like pretty incredible. And then I listen to music a lot. Electronic music is a really big portion. So finding different artists, playlists, songs that, you know, if I want to like meditate, I'll find something for that. If I want to just like uplift my energy, I'll find certain artists that are just have a different sound that are going to impact my energy and um, in fact, me in a more positive realm. And then um, community, going to these electronic music events, like right, the raves, and like, that's a part of pop culture. Now, there's a big association where like, back in the 90s, they were taboo. And you know, a lot of people are doing drugs, and don't get it twisted. Like there, people are going to do and use substances anywhere, which way they can. Um, but the biggest part about going to these shows is the people that I get to connect with. They, the community is one of the most accepting, one of the most positive, one of the most supportive that I've met. And I've been a part of lots of different communities, whether it's CrossFit, which is another one uh, you say what you want about it, but super positive people. Um, and they su super supportive um, athletic communities. I've been a part of quite a bit and the electronic music community just attracts so many different people from so many different genders, race, background, ethnicities, walks of life. Um, and they're all there for the same core reason, which is how the music makes them feel and impacts them. So I would say getting around community and surrounding myself with not just like-minded people, but uh, people that are connecting for a higher purpose, which in this case is the music. Um, and then the way I use cannabis with this is sometimes I'll go and I'll take like what we'll call a microdose, like 2.5 milligrams or just like a couple drops and combine it with some CBD. And I'll go meditate for like an hour. I'll just put my headphones in. And I noticed that when using cannabis, it like some of the science reports, it lights up different parts of our brain. And when you're meditating and you get into these deep meditative states, um, I find that I'm able to see things in a different perspective. So almost like a self therapeutic meditation, cannabis opens up uh, my perspective on how I'm either processing the music or processing my emotions. And I, I find it very, very beneficial. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it's um, one of those things where a lot of people may, you know, say they're self-medicating or whatever, but understanding like you actually have done the test and are understanding how to use it to self-medicate rather than just saying, hey, I'm going to do this because it makes me feel good or um, whatever. And I think, uh, you know, I think cannabis always can play a very important role in someone's, you know, mental health routine or whatever, but it's, I, I think it's important to have like other things, like you said, exercise, uh, getting enough sleep, et cetera. So you're not just relying on that. Um, and I guess on that note, you know, like anything else, sugar, you need a certain amount of sugar in your diet, but too yeah. much is a bad thing. Um, when, when would you say to someone that like, okay, maybe the, the cannabis usage is becoming instead of helping your mental health, hurting it or becoming a problem. 
That's a great question. And that's, uh, I, I would, that's, I would say that's not for me to answer because it's up on the individual's level. I know that my, my own, like I have my own thresholds and I have my own levels of like, all right, I know when I'm using this as a crutch, I actually just did, uh, I post on social media and I do different topics and <clears throat> escapism was one that I just did a topic on and I covered and I looked into it. And we all use escapism in different ways. It can be a positive impact and it can be a negative impact. It can become a crutch or it can be used as a tool. And for me, I have had experiences where I've been using cannabis as a crutch or an avoidance as, as an escape. Um, I think it's all about self-awareness. I think it's all about checking in with yourself and being honest with yourself. Am I using this uh, as a dependency or am I using this as a tool? What am I what is my intention? And well, I, what think is, I mean, I'm, what is yours? If you don't mind me asking, like, what is, yeah. how, how much is too much for you? For me? Oh, I'm such a lightweight. <laughs> like I would say anything, like if, if I'm smoking, which I try not to smoke too much just because, uh, inhalation is just not my jam. Um, I would say smoking anything over like 14% and like a, if I smoke a full joint with somebody or if I split a joint with somebody, I'm pretty stoned. Okay. Um, milligram wise anything over like 10 it's okay. like and then you're gotta, not doing it like every single day or every single um so i'm microdosing every single day like okay. uh like two milligrams of like a one-to-one -one, uh thc to cbd i'm doing that and i noticed yeah. that that keeps me it keeps but you're like not even you're not getting levels. like you're not even getting like stoned off that you know like super high no. you're just like kind of like getting shit yeah no but look there are times where if I'm going to go see John Digweed and I like want to have a little bit of a different experience, maybe I'm going to, I'm going to get crazy and smoke a whole joint, you know, but okay. for me, my tolerance level is like super low. So like for somebody else, it might be like taking a 50 milligram or hundred milligram. So what about level. specifically when you, you mentioned like a year ago, you were going through a tough time. Like when you're going through a tough time, like you said, escape, escapism can kind of be a crutch mm -hmm. or a positive. Like, are you then more, using it more than to get away from it or are you trying to use it less so that you're making sure okay i don't want to be making you know making sure i'm reliant on this right now great question um i am somebody who i got some advice from a guy i met twice and i surfed with him in california twice and i told him what was going on in my life and he was like dude if i could give you any advice that i wish i had when i went through what you were going through it's go home and just sit on your couch. Don't do anything. Don't go out. Don't drink. Don't, don't smoke. Don't, don't, don't do anything that could like keep you distracted from what's going on. And I was like, okay, I'm going to take that with a grain of salt. But, um, I personally know that during those times I would tend to lean into like using it more as a crutch. Um, so I, made an intention to just be very aware of that and not use it as much and just let what what I'm going through come up and in times of like real need where it's like okay today's a really tough day I'm going to lean into using cannabis to help me out more because I need it I need it during this moment um but if I can if I can get through it without it I'm going to I'm going to try and do that because for me it's exercising those muscles. I don't like to be dependent on much. There are some things that we need to be dependent on. Um, but I don't like to be too dependent on other things. I like to be able to try and get through them um, self-sufficiently, but using things as tools. So uh, that's that's kind of how I operate in, during, during the storm. Yeah, that, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's, you know, it's almost goes against what we would want to do in a tough time, which would be to maybe lean more into it, start using more, escape more of it. But then that kind of almost takes away, I guess, from what the healing process would be and would probably uh, just be kind of counterintuitive, even though, again, it probably is, is is what might feel the best at the time, but might not end For up sure. being the most productive. And we're, you know, we're pleasure seeking animals. We want comfort. We want, we want that. And yeah, we want the instant gratification. We don't want to like do the hard thing that's going to take longer and 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 whatnot. For sure. And I'm 
the first person to raise my hand and say, that's me, you know, right. like, <laughs> I want that. <laughs> I, I, I'll reach for it. Uh, but I think it comes down to, um, it comes down to intent and, and self-awareness. And that's something I'm trying to work on. So just being aware. And if you, if you don't need it in the moment, I would say like, keep going. Cause I do find myself like, I have really bad ADHD if you can't tell. And I'll find myself like with a moment of nothing to do. And it's like, I'm in, I need to fill this void. Let me go smoke a joint. Let me take an edible. Do it. But it's like, do I need it right now versus right. do I want it? Right. And that's where I'm like, okay, let me check in. Yeah. Does it, I mean, so it sounds like I'm sure a lot of people would like look at you working in the cannabis industry, hear you talk about cannabis and mental health and like think you're some huge stoner dude. Do you like, do you feel, find yourself kind of like battling that uh, perception a lot? To be honest, um, that's, I, that's a kind of like, that's a good take. And I haven't thought of it like that. I really, um, because I know I'm such a lightweight and because I come from, I got involved in cannabis through interviewing uh, people out in Los Angeles that um, used hash oil for like multiple scler sclerosis and, okay. uh, and like cystic fibrosis and stuff like that, like MS. And I interviewed these patients. And so I got into it from like the healing aspect. And I know a lot of people, like people will have that similar route and trajectory. Um, but that's kind of where I came from. But I know everyone's got a different perspective. And they're like, Oh, maybe you're in, really involved in mental health. And you also use weed. So like, that's, that's your thing. And it, it's, it's, it's a part of my thing. Um, it's not like the main focus of it. It's, it's more of my personal use. Um, but I guess I know myself where I know, like I said, I'm a lightweight, so I don't see it in that, in that, but right. I could see how somebody else might, might see that and be like, Oh, it's music and cannabis. They pair so well together. Of course this would happen. It's like, yes. And, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's, and I think that's interesting because probably my, my journey into cannabis was probably a lot more on from like the recreational, you know, less so on the healing medical side. So we probably have like had just, just completely different uh, early experiences with it. Um, when it comes to, you know, electronic music, there are probably there are a lot of different drugs that come to mind. Cannabis is is kind of up there among a lot of others. What do you think like? Just I guess in terms of this of the electronic music scene, do you think that's a good thing that people are you know open and experimenting with different things? Do you think it's kind of like not so great for the scene that so many drugs may be involved? Like I feel like there might be a lot of different ways to look at it. For sure, and like I was saying before, every scene community is has always got its thing, right? There's 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 um there's drugs everywhere in every, like, you're not going to stop people from doing them. And I'm not advocating for it. I have a real neutral stance. I, I stay with the music. Like for me, the music is, is where it's at. The music's the medicine. Um, and I always encourage people to, if you're going to do it, or if you're going to indulge, if people are going and doing these things, like test your stuff for whatever it is. Right. There are resources out there for you to be safe. And I think providing safe environments for people, if you know you can't stop it, provide a safe environment to where people can can be safe at these, at these events. Um, but I think that was more of a thing in the 90s. And like, I wasn't at the, the raves in the 90s. Um, so I can't speak to that. But I find that for me, the music's enough. Uh, I went to, there's a, one of my favorite clubs in the world. It's called stereo. It's in Montreal. It's an after hour spot and it holds about 800 people, probably the best sound system in the world that I've experienced so, thus far in my life. Wow. And it's incredible. If you get the chance, go, it's like Montreal's out on the Western part of Canada, right? No, no, Eastern. So above New York. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But BC is on the western part, and that's British Columbia. Is and Vancouver is another place that I I would like to go visit. Okay. Um, but Montreal has stereo, and this is a club where 
DJs and artists will come and they'll play marathon sets, which are like six, 12, 18, 24 hour sets. And I go, I'll go see artists there and they'll play 16 hours long. And like, it's a coffee and like a sandwich type of deal. And yes, there are other people that are indulging and like doing drugs there for sure. But like, you don't need it to go like the music. And if the sound is right, is enough of a spiritual experience for, for, for anyone. Um, that's kind of my take on like how, how people are, are, are using these substances. If they're not, um, I believe that if you're going to use them, test them. Uh, but the music is enough. And that's kind of the place that I want to try and direct or like, walk in and lead from for people with Medtronica is you don't necessarily need to, to do those things or indulge. Um, the music could be enough and to create a community around that. Yeah. I, I mean that, I, I think that makes sense. And I think most people are, are kind of in your boat that they're not there for the extracurriculars, if you will, and more yeah. so there for the music. But, um, well, uh, Ryan, I mean, this has been an awesome discussion. I've got, uh, I've got, I've got, I guess, one more music question related to, uh, and you, you make your own music, correct? So I'm starting to teach, I'm learning and I'm starting to teach myself Ableton, which has always been a dream of mine, um, to produce. So I've, uh, I've gotten hooked up with some, some artists in the space and I'm learning and I'm teaching. So no like own music production at the current moment. I mix. You DJ the show at the Benzinga event with yeah, the, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's how we all got connected originally. Um, we were at Benzinga and Alexa uh, at Twitter. She brought me in to DJ the party. We went back to back at the uh, at the Benzinga after party, which was super super fun. So at the current moment, I only I take other people's songs and I mix, which is originally how a lot of DJs got yeah. their start. Um, and then now it's more so like you're a DJ and a producer. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm learning and, and acquiring those skills, but mixing is how I, is how I got into it first and foremost. So my last question, I guess, when it comes to, uh, EDM is like, what, what, uh, cause I'm still kind of, I've moved up to Detroit like two years ago. I've gone to a bunch of shows, been getting more into it, but I still don't really understand all the different sub genres mm, like so what many. yeah like what makes something you know what makes something <laughs> techno house first big house first whatever so i'm gonna ask you which i'm sure this is gonna be a very easy question for you to answer but to tell me your top three like edm sub, sub genres that you like and kind of how they differentiate from other ones oh yeah for sure um so well to answer I want to touch on there are so many of these subgenres and it's 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 cool and it's also confusing to a lot of people because it's hard to be like how do you differentiate these things to your point it's like for the most part they sound all really similar um but there are small differentials uh differences in in the genres now for me my favorite and kind of how I got my feet wet in this scene was progressive house and it's that genre is specifically and that's digweed. All, that's digweed. That's Hernan Catania. There's a lot of the artists that I interviewed. Um, their progressive house is true to its name. It's progressive. It's all encompassing. So in a progressive house set, you can start with ambient and you can end with disco house and you can play techno. You can play um, it's a little disco. You can play all of these subgenres in within your set um i would say progressive traditionally has no definition to it because it is all of those different genres so like a progressive house track or a song would have different elements of whether it's tribal or techno or techno and house or disco and techno it can kind of be all of those things in my opinion but i would say I'm still new, relatively new to studying and being a student of this scene. Uh, I might not be the best person to explain it, but from my perspective, progressive house is 
it's it's all encompassing. It's my favorite genre because it it touches all of the music. And um, I don't think music should be siphoned or pigeonholed into into one area. You know, so many different elements of music are like so combining so many different elements of music, like everyone borrows from each other. And I think that's the way it should be. So I would say progressive house is probably my favorite genre uh, because it's a true journey. It, they, they bring you from ambient all the way to, you don't know where you're going to go. So bring right. your passport. Um, and then I would say uh, I really like deep house and like what makes deep house, deep house. It's usually um, a little bit of a, a lower tempo, a slower tempo. And um, it's got like a very similar, like plucky bass line to it. Uh, and the melodies are, are drawn out a little bit more. So I would say Deep House is probably my, my second choice. And then um, Disco, Disco House, just like really punchy, uplifting, positive, uh, positive uh, electronic music is, is probably my third favorite. I was also brought up on Disco, like my mom really liked disco and that was playing in the house a lot as a kid. So uh, I have an affinity towards that. So that, yeah, would, I mean, there it's, it's here. incredible. I don't know if you've ever seen any, some of the charts like that, ha that have all the different ones mapped out, but there are a million. It's but crazy. <laughs> I'll have to listen to some uh, like progressive house playlists and see, uh, you know, go on that journey as you put it and, and see kind of how it takes you through the different ones. But um, Ryan, this has been an awesome discussion. I, I, I love being able to kind of hop around between music, uh, mental health, cannabis, uh, all these things. I mean, where, where can people find more from you? For sure. Um, they can find mainly you find me on Instagram, um, at, just at Medtronica and then an underscore after me after that. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel. So I interview artists and I post content around mental health, specifically how music relates to it and how the music impacts mental health i also post like just like my own trial and errors so like right now i'm doing an ice bath saga where i'm like doing an ice bath every single day and like reporting back on my mental health there um and then those would be the two main places people can find me youtube and uh and um Instagram. And then in person, I'm in Florida. So I'm down in Miami quite a bit for events. And then uh, coming up next month, uh, I'm going to be going to South America to check out the music scene in Buenos Aires. So I'm really looking forward to there you go. With, That'll be fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to big connecting. club space guy down in Miami. Yeah, uh, I, I've been to club space quite, quite a bit, I would say like, not quite a bit, like four or five times. Um, I tend to find that if I'm going there, I need to be like very intentional about I'm going because I can end up there a lot. And uh, that would take away from me creating the content. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have to set set my limits there. Well, there you go. Uh, Ryan, again, thank you uh, for hopping. I'll throw that Instagram link in the chat. So Boom, double AB. AB Inception there. We got AB twice on the screen. Once there, once here. Uh, what up, guys? Thank you for tuning in. That was, a, of course, an interview we uh, we recorded last week with Ryan from Medtronica. Uh, go check him out, Medtronica, on Instagram if you want to learn more. Ryan's a good dude. It was great connecting with him. Now, for our last but not least interview of the day, we are going to be bringing on D. Choby, the CEO of Money Lion. We've had D on the show a few times before. Uh, I see him hanging out in the backstage. So as soon as he gives me like the thumbs up that he's ready to go, we'll go ahead and uh, and roll the intro and bring D on the show. There we go. Welcome back to Benzinga Live, D. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Good. I apologize. A little bit of a different setup today. I'm back home in Missouri for uh, for Thanksgiving this week, so you know I'm not not in the well, studio. Authentic. Oh yeah, I mean it is. <laughs> it, that's one way to put it. It is authentic. Mm. Um, well, D. Choby, the CEO of Money Lion, uh, on Benzinga Live again. Uh, ticker ML, which I'm a big. Uh, how often? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if you sports gamble at all, but when I hear ML, I think uh, I think money line. Like when you're money betting line. money line on a team. Like I, I like I took the Chiefs ML last night. And <laughs> it uh, also used to be the ticker of Merrill Lynch. So oh, we're, we're trying to take that over before. Uh, and then Bank of America bought yeah. Merrill Lynch. Correct. Exactly. Got it. Well, D. Uh, you, you know we're having you on Benzinga Live again. Of course, Money Lion. 
uh, reported, was it last, uh, last week, last Tuesday? Yeah, exactly. Last Tuesday, uh, record revenue, $110 million, up 24% year over year. So congratulations on that. Uh, I guess let's start there. What drove the growth? What drove the revenue growth? And uh, do you expect that trend to continue? Yeah, look, you know, any anytime you have a good quarter like this, um, you know, you got to look back a year or two in terms of just the strategy that you put in place back then that's working now, right? So, you know, we've been uh, beat up quite a bit. Uh, over the last year, um, <clears throat> because you know, I think the markets were just looking for instant um, cash flow generation. But if you think about the strategy that we put in place by having um, a marketplace first approach that then took the consumer through a journey into first party products that we historically were known for the neo banking style products, the banking, the insta cash, the wealth, the roundups. Um, but more importantly, I think we've moved the business to be holistic financial product search for the American consumer, right? That's available through our first party products, the neo banking um, product set that we've historically been um, market leaders in. But increasingly, we are powering the financial product search and marketplace experience across some of the largest publishers and digital um, providers out there. So, you know, what really drove the growth? 60 million inquiries came through um, our systems in the quarter, up from 50 million the prior quarter. We added 2.2 million customers in the quarter. So that compounded into $110 million of EBITDA uh, revenue. But more importantly for investors who'd been kind of waiting for us to really turn the corner and then accelerate on cash generation, um, you know, we had $13 million of adjusted EBITDA, which is very close to our cash generation number. Um, and we're really, really proud of that. I think the team did a really good job. But again, like I said, it's the culmination of a lot of the strategies that we put in place a couple of years ago that have started to pay off. Yeah. And again, I mean, just congrats on the quarter on the, on, on the strong report. I'm sure yeah. that, uh, you know, feels good after a lot of hard work going into it. Uh, D, I guess let's back up for a second. Cause I, we've had you on the show a number of times. I'm familiar with Money yeah. Lion. Uh, but there may be some people watching that aren't as familiar with Money Lion. Can you just give us a, a, a brief overview of what it is that you guys do? So then, and then we'll get back into it. Yeah, it's a fair question. You know, things have changed over time. Um, you know, we took the company public in 2021 via SPAC, and then the message was that uh, we're a um, we're, we're we're a digital bank, we're a digital fintech for the 90 million Americans that uh, self-identify struggling with finances. So we did everything together. Uh, you can bank with us, you can borrow money from us, you can round up into stocks, into crypto, into investment management accounts. You can get rewards, financial literacy. We bought a media studio, so we, we create just like Benzinga, our own content. Uh, we work with you guys to syndicate it as well. But again, that content is all around money topics, money life, money hacks. Um, but interestingly, over time, what we realized was we're not going to build every insurance product, every mortgage product, every, every, every personal loan product. So we started to get more and more in the marketplace um, business. If you're familiar with Credit Karma, uh, we allow any website, digital publisher, uh, financial institution to monetize the impressions that they're already getting on their websites through financial product monetization. With five lines of code, you can embed a marketplace on your website. So we power folks like CNBC, Fortune, Forbes, you know, think of the leading digital publishers. Um, you know, we're powering their savings calculators, their personal loans, sometimes their credit cards. And that's now becoming um, really the flywheel that's driving massive user engagement with our widgets, with our calculators, and even downstream our neo banking products, right? So it's keeping our CAC low, it's keeping our operating leverage high. And we think uh, we feel pretty good about going to 2024 with that business model. Got it. Um, and then, Ryan, so, you know, there's also record adjusted EBITDA of 13 million uh, last quarter. Uh, can you speak, I guess, just a little bit about like the profitability? And you mentioned, you know, last year, I guess the stock was getting beat up. What what mm -hmm. strategies have you guys like taken to either like save costs or uh, kind of just increase that that EBITDA number? Yeah, look, the first thing we did was, um, you know, we stopped playing this um, you know, growth at all costs strategy, right? So you, you, you'll you see that we mentioned in uh, our earnings presentation that we're approaching the rule of 40. The rule of 40 is this, you know, a, a metric that a lot of smart VCs and investors and public market investors look at to um, generally see 
Um, is, is the company growing? You can have 40% year over year growth rates, but be losing money. Um, but we are showing that we can grow in the 20 to 30% range and we can generate in the 15 to 25% margin range, right? So we were very close to that in Q3. Um, a lot of our competitors have said, hey, we're going to get there in 25 or 26. Um, we're very close to it already. So what do we do? We, we really focused on avoiding growth at all costs. So we brought down marketing spend and we relied more on organic um, marketing. Uh, despite bringing down our marketing spend, we added 2.2 total customers in the quarter, right? So we're up to 12.1 million total customers. This number um, a year ago was 5.4 million, right? So despite bringing down our marketing spend, we were growing customers. So our revenue was growing faster than our expenses were increasing, easy kind of um, you know finance 101, but really it was driven by marketing. We made some tough decisions on the size of our team. We brought down that, we brought our, the size of our team down by about 30% year over year. Um, and we continue to really focus on the business equation uh, across the board. We also saw growth in higher margin uh, areas like our consumer marketplace, um, where we're now helping more and more consumers find their next best financial offer. And that, you know, all of the compounding together um, is accelerating our performance here in 2023. I, I mean, and then like right now you mentioned, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, moving away from growth at all costs. I think we kind of saw that across the board as the Fed mm -hmm. started raising interest rates, companies that maybe were spending a lot of money to grow had to go to, to shift toward profitability, profitability mode to say like, okay, instead of just acquiring customers or growing at all costs, we need to actually start uh, making money. Yeah. How, how do you, I mean, do you plan on continuing that trend or is there a certain point you want to go back to focusing more on growth or is there a way, a way to do both at the same time? Yeah, I think there's built in growth in the market. Um, while we had a great third quarter, um, we can't ignore that it's been an incredibly tough macro environment. Um, our marketplace business is really reliant on advertising spend from financial institutions. So think about lenders, banks, uh, insurance companies, credit card companies. Um, you know, we're probably at one of the low points in the last 10 to 15 years on loan growth this quarter, right? Because the banks um, have deposit challenges, deposits, finance, uh, loan growth, the fintechs have, uh, they rely on securitization markets and wholesale funding. Cost of capital has gone up there. So despite all of that, we were able to piece together a strong Q3 that shows the resilience and the, the revenue diversification in the business. But as soon as that comes back, you know, the rails are laid, the pipes are laid for significant growth in both revenue and margin to just come back in uh, 2024. I, you know, I always tell this to my team is that, you know, you, we saw loan growth when interest rates were high in the mid 2000s and even before. It's just that um, it's it's hard for banks and fintech companies to grow their, their their loan book when there's so much uncertainty on interest rates. So as soon as we see at least that it's going to level off, that we're not necessarily in higher for longer right now, um, as soon as we start seeing some more data points and potentially a soft landing and that interest rates may be coming down in the back half of 24, I think that will give the certainty to a lot of these lenders to grow their loan books. And that really, you know, we're a recipient of that inbuilt growth going into 2024. Uh, outside of that, we're launching new features. We'll be launching, um, I think, a really cool consumer facing product search. Um, you'll be able to go to moneyline.com and use our search bar to um, you know, really find the personalized best financial offer for you, for you just by giving it a couple of input points. Um, we've built an entire interface on top of generative AI, right? Um, of course, it's been, a, it's been a crazy weekend with all the open AI work. Um, but regardless of where that lands, you know, our capabilities in-house on AI are so strong now that we can enable consumers to talk to their money um, you know, simple things from how much, uh, how much did I spend on Uber three months ago to, you know, how is my, uh, spending or earning, um, changing this month versus seven months ago. Right. So all of these things that we could do in a spreadsheet, money is going to enable many more people to just interact and talk with their money using our generative AI driven search and bank transaction, um, chat capabilities. So those, I think, just just naturally will bring in more people into our funnel. They'll expose more people to the Moneyline brand. 
And then of course, a portion of those people will convert into either first party products or third party products. It's a dual product approach we're taking both on the consumer side, as well as um, you know, just some inbuilt growth that we have on the enterprise clients spending at more advertising dollars on our network. Got it. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, like you mentioned mm-hmm. that there's just kind of built in growth in the market right now. And, and, and I guess being able to kind of focus on profitability while still growing at the same time, it's kind of like finding that sweet zone and, and being in the best of both worlds. Yeah. Um, D zooming out a little bit and just looking at the FinTech uh, world in general. I mean, of course, the biggest story really of the whole market this year has been about AI and the rise of chat GPT and all this. Uh, how is Money Lion using AI tools and, and products for uh, for its offerings to, to users? Yeah, look, I mean, we've been using AI um, voraciously since 2013. In fact, the reason we started the business was to see if we could use um, elements of artificial intelligence to predict when a consumer will have money and when they will run out of money. And, and based on that algorithm, we built all these interesting consumer facing consumer finance products and then the marketplace. Um, so, you know, artificial intelligence, the machine learning part of it, um, is embedded throughout our ecosystem. That is our DNA, right? Just, um, whether it's predicting when paychecks will decay or predicting the next best offer, um, in terms of LLMs, I think, um, you know, as soon as they were made available, um, we have been experimenting with it. The the, the good thing with having worked on artificial intelligence over the last 11 years was that we had about 50 engineers that were trained in artificial intelligence, right? It's not necessarily that easy to just uh, pick up that discipline. Um, Our uh, DevOps, if you will, right, Um, our infrastructure to support deployment of these models was already very robust. So I think that you'll find us as a um, as a leader in consumer facing generative AI being um, delivered to consumers. Um, of course, the regulators have a view on how com- how how the compliance side of it. Um, so I think that's probably the only thing that's kind of holding us back and kind of being more aggressive in releasing some of these until we know exactly um, that we've limited the hallucinations of the models. Um, you don't want to be talking talking to your financial chatbot about your money and it hallucinates, right? So. Um, those safety and soundness elements have been um, really front and center in terms of just putting that in. I think it's okay. I think you have a little bit of a degrees of freedom if you're just using ChatGPT and it hallucinates for something that's not your money. But because we're touching uh, money matters, we have a little bit of a self-imposed higher bar um, in being quick to market until we know that we've got, we've kind of got taken those steps. Um, but that said. You know, we are going to accelerate um, in, um, in in kind of bringing those to the market um, as early as Q1 of 2024. Well, there you go. Uh, any other hot takes when it comes to fit, like just like the industry of fintech mm-hmm. overall, future of fintech uh, as we head into the new year? I mean, 2024, this is so we're just keep, keep on going. I guess the years don't stop. The years don't start. Exactly. Like I've been doing this since uh, 2013. Right. And um you know, money lines played a strong role in the entire ecosystem and in the industry of fintech, and just kind of moving things forward from uh, whether it's bank verification, data aggregation, um, bundling products together, um, creating entire seamless experiences all in one. That historically would have been very hard to imagine that you could have your bank and your broker dealer and your uh, investment advisor all sitting together in one chassis. Um, but those things have, have all been solved problems now. I think the future is going to be all around personalization. We've always had this idea of self-driving money and kind of do it yourself or do it for me or match me or, or, or do, you know, kind of um, do the work for me. I think increasingly in 24 and 25, lots of great things will happen where you could use the compute power that's increasing in the chips. You could imp- use uh, a lot of the LLM capabilities to safely and consistently deliver um, a world where a lot of the friction between um, exactly what insurance product I should have for my family versus the guesswork, that's going to come out. Um, and generally, more and more of these products are going to be embedded and offered via API, and consumers will have an opportunity to choose the interface that they want to use um, to interact with all these various APIs that are working in the back end. Um, so look, a lot of good technical progress still to be done. Uh, still early innings in the evolution of fintech. It's still not um, fully mature. There's still um, lots of dollars that are in traditional institutions that that will find their way here. So uh, we remain 
uh, committed to the mission and pretty bullish about it. Well, there you have it. Again, D. Choby, the CEO of Money Lion, ticker ML. Uh, you guys can also go to moneylion.com or download the app from the App Store if you'd like to learn more. D, anything else you want to leave us with? No, just uh, have a great Thanksgiving, everybody. And uh, thank you again for having me. You do the same. Happy Thanksgiving, Happy. D. All right, guys, that was D. Choby again, the CEO of Moneyline. As you can see here, I mean, that stock has come back strong the past few months. Uh, really going back since May, about the last six months, the stock has gone from 10 to 35. I'm a no mathematician, but that sounds like over a 300% increase to me. Not too shabby for the guys over there at Moneyline. We'll have to keep watching uh, this stock. Uh, I mean, I'm sure some of the chartists, some of the, the technical traders out there are looking at this chart and seeing – uh, you know, maybe some th that this rounding bottom kind of continues that formation. Um, but all right, guys, we've had a long show today. Again, to recap, of course, started with the Kaiju Educational Series, Episode 3, How to Set Up Your Trading Platform. Shout out Ryan Pinnell for coming on that. And then we did our little special uh, kind of off the beaten path interview that we did last week. That was with Ryan uh, from Medtronica and Truly. Shout out to Ryan. Uh, great dude. Very excited to continue our conversations together in the future. And then last but not least, of course, D. Choby, the CEO of Moneyline, ticker ML. Uh, that'll be a wrap for us today. Of course, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, tomorrow, what is, so tomorrow is a full trading day, I believe. Markets closed on Thursday, and then it's a half day on Friday. Let's check this. Let me check Thanksgiving trading hours nice i can't i can't give you guys with bad information all right uh i can't give you guys bad information all right holiday let's see okay so okay no Ooh, wait what hold on okay the market each market will close early 1 p.m on friday november 24th and then Thursday, the market will be closed all day. So yeah, Black Friday is like a half day. Wednesday, tomorrow is uh, business as usual. But yeah, have a great Thanksgiving, everyone. We'll be back next week. Peace and love, y'all. Stay green.